Well, it's that time again. My gosh, where did the year go? <laughs> We're back again. We're back with the Wisdom of the Elders, which started in the year 2010. And I think it's very interesting, Mr. Yeager, that one of your clients was in that first panel, Oscar Brand. Yeah. Two of your clients, David excuse me, and David Amran. Yes, two of them were in that first panel. And now we finally found their agent. <laughs> so we'll, we'll hear more about them from a different viewpoint. Well, welcome to Wisdom of the Elders. I'm Sunny Oaks. I'm the creator of this insane event. And I've loved doing it every year since 2010, and also at Folk Alliance, and now Southeast Regional has been doing it for three or four years. They did one in Farm this year, and they've done it up in Folk Music Ontario, so it's, the idea is spreading. And the idea is to get some of our elders, before they leave us, to talk about their <laughs> to talk about their experiences. Yeah, I know I'm older than all of you. The heck out of it. <laughs> and and the idea being that they've all been interviewed a lot of times singularly, but somehow if you interview in a group, then you get a different kind of a connection because you get the interaction of shared stories and stuff like they that. Don't look that old. <laughs> okay, the story is, when we, when we started this event, uh, I, I arbitrarily chose the age of 70 as being good for being an elder. And then Angus Finnan, who is the head of Folk Alliance International, said, Sonny, make it 65. <laughs> so, How old is Angus? He's nowhere near there. I know, that's <laughs> right. So yeah, 65 is old. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So we're going to do three interviews of approximately 15 minutes. We're not going to watch the clock. And then we're going to have general questions. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a chance even to ask a question yourself, if you choose to do so. So let's start out with uh, oh, my co-coordinator my co down there is Jess Faniff, who is with the, Don't tell me. I'm going to get this straight. Think Martha's Vineyard. MVY. Yes. which is a station in Martha's Vineyard. And she, well, she started out on UMB as a uh, folk DJ, and then she moved over to, to, to MVY, and now she's worked her way all the way up to music director, and she's definitely nowhere near 65, so she's That's doing fine. very well. Thank and you. And to start out, Jess is going to do the first interview. Well, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me to co-host with you, and great idea. This is such a, like a brilliant idea, clearly because um, it's catching on in other places, so happy to be here. And we're going to talk to Tret Fury first, and we could talk the whole 15 minutes about <coughs> her career, but I will try to do a little summary here to start. So Tret started at a very young age playing music, age 19, moved to L.A., and became a guitarist and vocalist for Spencer Davis, touring with him, writing with him, and then uh, recorded her debut album, which, no big deal, was produced by Lowell George of Little Feet. Uh, she became very interested in sound engineering in LA and uh, was one of the few, maybe one of two, women engineers in LA. And she became the first woman who was invited into the sound engineers union. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so, in the early 80s, Tret uh, kind of turned away from that direction and turned towards independent music, uh, the independent side of the industry, and was a very key figure in the blossoming movement of women's music. And uh, she released many, many of her own solo albums, is it like 14 then? 16. 16. Wow. And, uh, three of them with Chris right, exactly, yeah. and that was my next. Uh, it was several of them with Chris Williamson as a duo and uh, started Tomboy Girl Records mm -hmm. and uh, was the president of Local 1000 for many years, the Traveling Musicians Union. Uh, also, short list here of other things, she paints pet portraits, she's published a cookbook of her own recipes and started Tomboy Girl Clothing Line. Oh. <laughs> right? Seriously. <laughs> So that's the summary, that's the short summary. Um, so first I think I want to ask you, I w was sitting in on the woman, women's panel, which was fantastic if anyone was there, and I got to hear you talk about how you really started, which was at a very young age, you said you were born into a family where you kind of had to prove yourself. Uh, oh yeah, well, um, I, was, uh, I was a replacement child. 
So I, I think that a lot of my forming of who I am and my strength as a woman, traveling mostly in the men's world, is because I was a replacement child. What um, does that mean? I'm about to, to tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put away. Put away. Um, my mother uh, lost her uh, third son to what they call a crib death then. Mm -hmm. And I was conceived in her grief uh, because she wanted another boy right away to replace that child. Mm -hmm. But she didn't get a boy. She got a girl. And when I was born, she was very disappointed. Mm -hmm. My father was delighted because he got his little brown-eyed girl. Mm -hmm. But and not that my mother did not love me, but it was a challenge. And she was not happy until five years later when my youngest brother was born. So my early years were about proving myself. Look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, I'm, I'm good too. I'm not a boy, but I'm good too. And uh, it really, I think, really gave me the courage to become who I am. And, uh, and I had musical talent, so it wasn't like, that's not why I'm just a performer. I started playing piano when I was five years old. And uh, I was writing songs when I was seven. And my piano teacher would have me play them for her high school students uh, at, at the age of seven. And my mother was a singer, so I got a lot of my talent from her. But truly, until Scott was born, I was not whole, because she wasn't whole. So you talk about this kind of idea of proving yourself as a woman, and that's a thread throughout your entire career, right? Mm -hmm. um, I kind of was wondering, how does that, and we t someone touched upon this in that w great women's panel, how does that play into also kind of boosting other women up, you know, because you kind of have to fight for your own little plot of land, right, and be right. like, here I am, and prove yourself, like you're saying. Um, but what are the challenges of also kind of bringing other people kind of up with you versus kind of fighting to, to make your space? Well, you know, I, I think I was, uh, well, I think I was fortunate in that, um, even though I, I went into the women's movement kicking and screaming, because to me it seemed like, well, this is not going to get famous in the women's movement. <laughs> That's what I was about at a young, you know, young age. But, um, you know, by, I had two major label deals in the 70s when I lived in LA. Uh, but I didn't have major label success. So uh, as I approached 30, nobody was interested in me. Plus, I was considered a lesbian, even though I was, didn't identify, identified mostly as bisexual in that time, but, but I was identified as lesbian. So a 30-year-old lesbian in mainstream was Forget it. Just forget it. So I discovered through um, through engineering, actually, June Millington asked me to, to uh, engineer Chris Williamson's children's album. And we became fast friends, partners, musically and personally. And uh, I entered the women's music genre. And that, to me, was the most life-changing, not just for me, but for, for women. The work that we did in the 80s to bring women into music, because Every label had one woman on their label, and only one. So it was always a fight for women to get a deal. So Olivia Records was born out of a conversation that Chris Williamson had with some women, some separatists in, in DC, and said, you need to start a record label. So they started a record label in 1975 that was women-owned, women-staffed, women artists, women sound people. Uh, I be became their house, the house producer for, for Olivia and the house engineer. Um, and it gave women an opportunity to grow in a safe space without the competition of being always, oh, she plays pretty good for a girl, you know. And this, this was an industry. And we played, we had concerts where thousands and thousands of women would come. And women had, for the first time, the encouragement to pick up an instrument because they saw other women doing this. And I was like the first little rocker because I played electric guitar. And um, a lot of the women didn't like that at first because it was, it was folk music, although we weren't considered folk artists. They were, the women's industry was really separate. From, and I do not understand why because we were doing the same music. But it was just a little more women focused. But um, so I, be, I was the, uh, the rock and roller, and I gave permission to women to pick up electric guitar and learn how to strut on a stage. So that was important work, really. So I think reading sort of the list of things you've done, and then even more recently, in more recent years, sort of like the, the, the pet portraits, which I think is just so great, and you know your cookbook and things like that, you're so passionate about several different things. Right. I think being here for a few days now, talking to people of my age, 
um, a lot of the struggles we have is like burnout and feeling like we're doing so much or pulled in so many different directions. I've met so many musicians here who also work at venues or who do X, Y, and Z other jobs. I myself have three jobs right now, you know, so I wondered if you could, this is a question that everyone could, uh, you know, answer or talk about, but I was wondering if, if you could speak to your experience of maybe being pulled in all those different directions, or is it more one thing led to another naturally? To me, it's all a creative process. Um, and the other thing I do is that I teach. I teach songwriting and guitar on Skype and in workshop settings. And to me, that's, that's another uh, integral part of how I can help other younger artists grow, teaching people how to write better songs, how to play their instrument better. That to me is very, I'm passionate about that because I have a gift and I'm able to share it in that way. Um, but see, everything I do is, is really based on my creativity. So I don't feel a burnout because I feel fortunate that I have the gifts of being able to share my gifts, to teach, to play my music, to perform. To, to paint, that's something that I've only been doing for 10 years, but you know, I just found I had a, a capacity to paint pets. I mean, I don't paint pets, I paint <laughs> portraits. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all, it's a, <laughs> to me it's all the same thing, you know, and, um, and it, I am, I mean, I have a gift that, having this gift, it's my, my job to share it in the world as best I can. So that's that's how I feel about it. <clears throat> I mean, we could talk about this next question for like an hour, but how do you balance that feeling of this is my gift, this is what I want to share, all the creativity comes out in all these different ways with you know making a living? Someone asked me specifically when I was talking to them about hosting this panel, you know, how about ask them like when do you know when to like get rid of your day job and like go for the creative stuff like like making a living or being able to, to live, you know, uh, while doing all the creative things. Can you speak to that at all? God, it's really hard. Um, and I, you know, I think it's much harder now for younger artists because, you know, there's, there's more performers, there's less venues. They're taking away CDs, the capacity to listen to CDs, so we have no way to sell our work. People are streaming. Artists don't make money from streaming. I tell people in my shows, I say, buy the music first. I'm happy that you stream because you can't put all the music on your phone. But buy the music first, support the artists because there's no career left for, for a lot of younger artists. Um, but the balance is hard. You know, I book myself, I manage myself. I do way too much in that, in that end as well because you kind of have to these days to make a living. Um, I mean, I'd love to have a manager if anyone out there is interested in <laughs> trying to handle me. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's hard. That's the hard part is how, do I, how can I get out there and make a living? Because really most of my living comes from my touring. But be able to promote the show, get the people to the show, book the shows in a, in a fashion where I'm not crisscrossing this country every weekend. Um, it's... it's it's tough. And, and I think that younger artists have to know how to do more in order to survive. There are no record companies anymore, you know, and uh, you've got to, it's all, it's all DIY, you know, you've got to do it yourself and, and you need to learn all the skills you can. Great. Um, I think maybe we'll use the last couple minutes here uh, to go back in time. I'm really interested in the time that you spent in LA and you said something about, you know, every time someone walked into the room to record with you when you're a sound engineer, they were like, so where's the engineer? Cause yeah, because I had, a, I had an androgynous name. So, um, yeah, the studio owner would, first he would just say my name. And so people would come in and, and again, yeah, ask where's the engineer? And I would say, I'm your engineer. And I would just watch the blood just drain <laughs> out of their faces. And, uh, you know tough, you're going to have to deal with it, I'm your engineer. And there would be a lot of times there where I'd be, something would go wrong in the booth and, you know, the producer or one of the musicians in the other room would say, I better go in there and uh, fix it for the little lady, you know. And it's like, get the, out of here, you know. I do know what I'm doing. Um, but it was always a challenge. And then later, for some reason, the studio owner, and this was before I started, producing and, and engineering together, and I would go to different studios to produce the projects that I was working on. But the engineer would then start telling the clients that I was a lesbian. And I thought, well, that's weird. Why would you tell 
why would you tell your clients that I'm a lesbian so they don't hit on me and get embarrassed or, you know, I mean, what? I never could quite figure that out. What does it have to do with sound engineering? You know? <laughs> but, uh, so there's always, there was always those, those challenges of, of being a woman. And I, you know, my name kind of got me, got away with stuff where I had more clients because they didn't know I was a woman until they got there. It's a known thing that uh, women have better hearing than men. They do. And so maybe they thought that they were doing their clients a benefit since you were a lesbian, that oh, you were more yeah. intensified in your hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I listen very closely. So obviously, you know, coming up being such an important figure in the, the women's music movement, um, now we look at today and Me Too and everything that's going on with women now. And I wonder if, having been so involved then and now, you know, here we are today, do you feel like there's been a lot of progress or are you sort of like, geez, are we still talking about this? And It's a pendulum. <clears throat> I think we, we, we went very far to the left and now we are swung so far to the right. It's a frightening time uh, for all of us, but I think it's a really frightening time for women because they're just taking away. I mean, this Kavanaugh thing is, is unbelievable and unconscionable and egregious, you know. So I just, I don't understand it. And, um, you know, of course, what now Trump is trying to have a re-election in Arizona. Yes. Yes. Oh, come on, please, you know, because he's not getting his way. But it's bringing out the, it's just bringing out all this hostility, you know, just all this homophobia, all this racism, all of it. And it is, it's a scary time for, for, for many of us, not just women. Do you have a song you'd like to play for us to maybe bring us up in mood after oh, that downer sure. session? Is that what we're doing? I can't sit and behind a table and sing. I can because the sound guy made it too tight. <laughs> oh, and then we have this. Well, that's it's a, I have a very hot pickup, so you'll want to bring that way down. I don't want to hit you. <laughs> Sunny Oaks, taken out by the neck of the guitar. <laughs> I'd like to share the title song of my most recent album. And I do say album when I tell people I have 16 albums because I precede CDs by two decades. So This is the title song. It's called Roses in November, and it's a... It's a subtle take on that uh, Chinese hoax, climate change. <laughs> Fall is showing up much later this year. Roses blooming in November. I picked tomatoes from the garden last week. Another unseasonable season Peppers red and hot and dropping to the ground And I've got a fall crop of zucchini It's still too soon to rake the autumn leaves Another unseasonable season that the hurricanes are fiercer, tornadoes tearing up and ripping our towns. But let's go driving through the countryside. Gas is much cheaper these days. Well, I bought some apples, not a blemish to be found, though the limes are hard and thready, and does the rice seem more expensive than before, another unseasonable season, and did you notice that we had more rain, though other states are deep in 
drought Still let's go driving through the countryside Gas is much cheaper these days Should we go out and buy a brand new truck? Hell, the rates are really low We could drive across the state so fast and outrun the storm that's about to blow included you in this group. <laughs> All right, it's my turn now to interview. <laughs> my such a long time friend, I just don't even know where to begin. Now I'm going to tell the story the correct way. Okay. <laughs> he keeps messing this story up. So no, I'm a storyteller, so uh... you, you sure didn't make up a story. On that. <laughs> we both attended something called the Spring Thing down outside of Philadelphia that Diane Tankle was running, and uh, so I went down there for the first time. And it's a it's a camp for families and some musicians, but just playing folks who love folk music and they have all kinds of stuff going on. And one of the things that goes on is that there's people gathering around, song circles and what have you. So there was a song circle going on on the porch of this building. So I figured, let me go hear some nice music. So I went up there and there were no chairs, so I sat on the floor with my back against the, braced against the leg of a table. And on the table, there was this couple and they were the next to sing. And I'm sitting down on the floor and I'm hearing this music from heaven. I mean, it, the harmonies were so amazing and the voices were so great. I said, wow, I really like this guy and his wife and they're so good. What a sound. And that's where I first met Reggie Harris and his wife Kim. And over the years, I hired them for many concerts. And way back in the early 80s, now they lived in Philly at the time. Way back in the early, oh, mid-80s, I invited them to come. I, I had moved up here in the Catskill Mountains, and I invited them to come up where I live and do a concert up there. And the next morning, Kim said to me, Sonny, I was doing real estate. Show us some houses. And I thought, oh, she's kidding. What kind of crap? You know? <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll waste some time. So I drove around to look at houses, and the first round, they didn't find anything. The second time around, she finds the house that she's... We'll take it. I said, what? <laughs> now this is back in the mid 80s. So we're talking you know, over 30 years ago. And uh, they moved up from Philadelphia. And we have been neighbors ever since. Now Reggie, I'm gonna ask Reggie some questions about other stuff, of course, but it's like he's my brother. We've shared so many experiences. And let's, let's start at the beginning, because that's logical. Right. Where, what kind of a family did you come from? 
came from an African-American family. Uh, I grew up in a house with my mother and my grandmother and my sister. Uh, we had moved into my grandmother's house when my parents got divorced. I was about a year old or so. Um, I came to find out years later that my mother and father were fighting while I was uh, being hatched. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the story has never been really delivered, but um, essentially, I always wondered why my, my sister had a, a godmother and I didn't. But as it turns out, my godmother was the person my father ran away with. I didn't find that out until probably 20 years ago. And uh, my mother, uh, very fiercely religious, very fiercely, uh, I wouldn't even say fiercely proud. She was just a woman who uh, got things done. She hung in there. She had great faith. Um, so she moved into this house with, uh, with her mother, which was not an easy thing to do. They did not get along. She was the oldest. I discovered, again, late in life, that uh, my mother and uh, my aunt, Sweetsie, uh, two sisters who were devoted to each other, helped my grandparents buy that house. And they pulled their money with my grandmother and grandfather to buy a house that my grandfather found. And the house was in an all-white neighborhood. So uh, the story goes that this woman who I uh, knew only from her periodic drop-ins at our house. Um, she would drop by the house every few months, and uh, she would come in, and she'd be so, so welcomed in our house. And I had no idea who this woman was. And, uh, and they never explained who she was, but um, she, they'd say, Miss Stout. Say hi, Miss Stout. Well, it was Judge Stout. <laughs> uh, she was a lawyer, and then she became the first female African-American judge in Pennsylvania. She helped my family buy that house. Mm -hmm. She found a white realtor that would sell them the house. She and the realtor fronted the purchase, and then this family moved in, and it was my family. So we were the first family in the 3700 block of 17th Street, and within a year and a half, the entire block and surrounding streets went black. Wow. So I, I was raised in that house. I was raised in the church, um, the Nazarene Baptist Church at Nice and Like Homing Street, as we were taught to say. And, um, they said, say the name of your church like you're proud of it, and tell people where it is in case they want to drop by. <laughs> and I have no, uh, no evidence that anybody dropped by that <laughs> church because I said where it was. But it was a mixed blessing because um, I, I was surrounded, as I talked last night in, in the presentation, I was surrounded by the sounds of people who had endured the black migration. And in my house, we sang together and, and in church. And uh, so my mother made sure that I was part of all of those entities and institutions growing up had us in church all the time we were you know cultural things connections but it, when the opportunity to push me out into other neighborhoods to better schools uh, she took every opportunity to get me out of that neighborhood and get me into opportunities that I could advance and the fact that I'm sitting here today is was a result of her push when, um, when I had you come to the school where I taught and you spoke to my students and you talked about um, junior high school, the integration thing. Yeah. You want to talk about that a bit? I thought that was, the, the kids really zeroed in on this. You really impressed them. Well, in sixth grade, my mother went to a meeting, which she didn't, have, she didn't go to very often because she worked in a clothing factory making clothes for boys, young boys. But on this night, for whatever reason, she went to the meeting and they told her and all the other parents who were assembled that they, we could go to the junior high school two blocks up the street. Or they said, you can go across town to J. Cook Junior High School and it's a uh, better school. And it was in a white neighborhood. Um, and, uh, and she came home and said, well, you're going to a better school. So I got on a bus and a, a trolley and uh, ended up in this playground with kids who didn't look like me. And there weren't many of me, but there was, there were, you know, I guess the school was 80% white, um, heavily Jewish, uh, but also Ukrainian, you know, Polish. Um, and we ended up trying to figure it out in the playground um, and in our classes. And, um, and nobody mentioned that Philadelphia was integrating the schools, but that's what was happening. And, um, and so we were just back and forth every day and figuring out this, you know, this new landscape. And then in eighth grade, my uh, junior high, uh, my eighth grade high school teacher was also my uh, homeroom teacher. Uh, my mother made it to another parent-teacher meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and he was a fair-skinned black man who, uh, who said to my mother, you know, Reginald is a very eclectic boy. 
And I don't know what she translated that to be. <laughs> but he said, you know, Reginald, I, I understand he's going back to your neighborhood for high school, um, but I think he would do better if he went to Omni High School, which is the school most of these kids are going to. He does very well in the class with the rest of the students. I think he would, he would have better opportunities. It's a better school. So I went three more neighborhoods away and uh, landed in a place where uh, during the Second World War, it was known that neighbors and different people flew swastikas during the war, uh, unimpeded. And my reason for being in that school was to take German for four years because German was not offered at my neighborhood school. So I was committed to taking German and uh, having a German teacher, Elsie Abold, who um, found out that I was taking German and was able, only able to go to that school if I continued to take German. And so she made it her mission for three and a half years to flunk me. Whoa. So that's what I was fighting, and my high school counselor and my choir director were my safe space and my champions. And, uh, and the fact that uh, in the first year, she did realize that since she loved to have us sing German songs, I was the best singer in her class. <laughs> so the fascinating thing was when I finished high school, I went back to a choir concert that December, four months from, you know, or six months from graduation. And I went up to her, because she was there at the concert, and I said, good evening, Missy. Well, I'm, I'm good to see you. And she said, I'm Susie. Do I know you? <laughs> and I said, I've been in your German class for three and a half years. She had a nervous breakdown. Whatever. And she looked at me and she said, I, I, I don't remember you. And I thought, wow. You, it introduced me, that and the neighborhood, and the neighborhood experiences I had, it introduced me to a lot about um, what race was in America and what I was going to have to face. Uh, it didn't solve any problems. It also separated me in an uh, emotional way from the community in, what, in which I was living. So it put me directly between the neighborhoods I was now operating and, and learning in and the people who had brought me up and surrounded me and uh, I'm a part of my heritage. And then where did you go from there? From there, where did you go to college? My first year I went to Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, I, um, I was on track to become a missionary or a minister. Uh, I was raised up in my church and I was identified as a leader very early on. So um, they were pushing me to take the mantle of leadership. So I ended up in Atlanta at a uh, Christian college there um, where I could also take uh, courses at Atlanta University. And, um, and now I was a 18 year old northern kid, northern black kid in the middle of Atlanta, which was integrating, had just integrated their schools very reluctantly. Um, so I had all kinds of experiences that year in Atlanta um, as a northerner, as a black eclectic kid, <laughs> because most of the black students who were at the, the college in Atlanta had come from the south, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia. Um, so they were completely fascinated by me. Uh, and everywhere I went that year, people would say, so where are you from? Because you ain't from here. Uh, so again, I had a new, uh, new community that I was not, I, that did not belong to. I, um, we agreed at the end of the year, the college and I, to part company. And I returned to Philadelphia. And it was then that I, I reconnected with some of my high school friends, and they were the reason that I got the first job that I got. I decided to go back to Temple University. Um, and going to the, one of those jobs was the reason I, I was dating a woman who demanded that I learn to play guitar. <laughs> Are you lucky? <laughs> yeah. I did actually get to thank her years later. Um, she was, uh, we were in the early stages of dating and, and she said, you know, you are so musical. You should be playing the guitar. I'm taking guitar lessons. And I said, well, you know, kind of busy. I was coaching basketball and I was in church and I was doing this. And she said, you really ought to play guitar. I said, well, I really don't have time. She said, really? Well, maybe then you're not as interesting as I think you are. <laughs> and I said, teach me a chord. <laughs> she was really cute. <laughs> All right, well, I want to fast forward. So I know you went to Temple, and I know you, um, you, you 
worked in a summer camp and you met Kim there and you got married and you were married for quite a long time. Fast forward, I get to... <laughs> Notice that was when I'm gone by Philip. <laughs> DJ to the max. <laughs> Sung by brother's son. <laughs> with my daughter. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so fast, have a question. <laughs> the, the question was, fast forward, I meet you and uh, we become friends. I put you in a couple of concerts here and there and then then I want you to quick tell a, a condensed version of your intro to the Phil Oaks song night. Well, you came up and you asked Kim and I if we wanted to be on a song night and uh, we said, what's that? And she's, you know, Phil Oaks song night. And we said, oh, oh, I think I've heard of Phil Oaks. And uh, you said, so what Phil Oaks songs do you know? And uh, we looked at each other and we said, uh, exactly none. <laughs> and he said, I'll fix that. And he sent us three songs and we learned one of them. What's that I hear? That's right. And we showed up and there were all these people there singing these amazing songs. Yeah. And the thing I noticed first and foremost about you know, the songs that people were doing, that every now and then there would be a song that Phil had written about black people. And I thought, hmm. Because I knew, you know, performers were, you know, singing songs about, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize the connection, civil rights, completely from some of the songwriters, and I knew about Pete Seeger, about <laughs> by the time I met you, I actually met him once, uh, but I was just really uh, stunned by the fact that this committed activist um, was writing about the plight of, of African Americans. Um, it wasn't something I'd come in contact with that much, and, uh, and then at the same time, I was being politicized by touring around America, and uh, seeing some of these things he was writing about um, in evidence and seeing that they were still much too relevant. So being part of the Song Nights also introduced me to a, a host of performers who had embraced this mission. Including your partner? Greg Greenway. They met at a Song Night, I think that was we did. absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and, um, and Greg and I started talking about race immediately uh, in between sports. <laughs> <laughs> and where have you taken that to now? Well, we are now doing the show Deeper Than the Skin. Uh, which is a show that is songs and stories, uh, mostly stories about our friendship and how our friendship has helped us each to negotiate uh, the legacy of race in our lives, but also the legacy of hope uh, that allows us to speak to the issue without uh, being defensive uh, and, and in an effort to meet people where they are, whether they're committed activists or whether they're people who have never thought about race and how it impacts their lives and the world. Um, so that um, we have come along as brothers because we, we were able to have the conversations. We were able to plunge in and, and discuss books and um, in incidents and events and the history and, uh, and find those tough places where our stories didn't connect and, uh, and hear each other. And, uh, and we had the marvelous connection of music to do that and um, so this has been a very natural, organic uh, show to pursue. Um, and it continues to evolve. Um, we've been doing it now for about three years. Uh, we still do our solo projects and uh, uh, other performances with, with other performers. But um, it, it is, you know, there's, there's no day or evening that I, you know, if I'm performing on my own and if I have, you know, three or five shows with Greg, I just step from one way of looking at it to another. Um, with a more vibrant format because you've got a black and a white man on stage who are friends sharing this material. And, and the thing I say often about him is that I knew after our first years of friendship that wherever he is in the country, with all white audiences or whatever he's coming in contact with, that he's bringing it up. Nobody's paying him to bring it up. Some people are probably paying him not to. <laughs> But the very fact that he was willing to go out in the world and, and also to write about it, it was, I've sung on almost all of his albums and, um, and these songs about Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi, they always came up. And he was writing from an informed place, not taking on the voice of the people he's writing about, but from his perspective, seeing their struggle. Uh, and he saw my struggle. So we say, we see each other's hearts. Well, something happened about 10 years ago, which almost took away your life. Can you want to talk quickly about that? Yeah. Um, it was a major, major. Well, it was the, three weeks ago was the anniversary of my liver transplant, 10th anniversary. 
Okay. And as a matter of fact, I was remembering that. Uh, thank you. I suffered for uh, 10 years uh, with an autoimmune illness that um, uh, uh, declining health, it would not begin to take in the experience. Uh, but I traveled for years. Uh, slowly, I was itching all the time. I was um, in pain. I was um, three shades of brown, uh, gray, yellow, and, um, and a little uh, green. <laughs> Uh, at 135 pounds in November of, uh, of, of 2008, and um, at a place where the doctors were saying I had about a week to live, uh, a liver showed up, and it was a perfect match for me. Uh, you also do a lot of other things. You uh, do stuff at the Kennedy Center. Found what? Founding teacher artist, what does that mean? That's what you wrote to me. <laughs> uh, somewhere in uh, the late 80s, um, Kim and I got a, a week of performances at the Kennedy Center in their terrace theater. And I got a call from a woman named Lynn Silverstein who was just beginning uh, a, an outreach for their education office. And she, what she said was, I'd like you to, I see you're going to be here for a week of performances. Would you be willing to? Uh, do a teacher workshop for our teachers. We have a teacher workshop program. And we said, yeah, that'd be great. And our thought was, we come in and sing some songs for the teachers and talk about this underground railroad thing. That was not at all what she had in mind. Um, so she said, great, send me an outline. And we sent an outline that basically said, we'll sing some songs and talk about the underground railroad and you give us a check. <laughs> and uh, she wrote back and she said, I really like this outline. It has some really nice aspects. Um, let's look at the first two things you were talking about. Can you expand on that? And we're like, no. <laughs> and little by little, she did a workshop on us over the course of a month. And she transformed what we sent her into a curriculum connection on the Underground Railroad and showed us how we would come into the room. And she didn't show us anything. She, she demonstrated through you know, taking us through the process. Well, that program, uh, and she did that with about seven other artists. And that program now has over 250 artists uh, over all of the states, uh, but then what they did was they took arts uh, councils and arts uh, present uh, arts centers, and married them to education systems, uh, you know, board of educations or, or arts partners, and those two people will work together to bring artists into the schools to make curriculum connections to show teachers how to use the arts you know, across the disciplines, and we were seven of the founding artists in that program, and all of us looked at each other and we said we had no idea. <laughs> uh, so that was that program, which uh, also led to the Woodrow Wilson uh, program of, of uh, being a lecturer at colleges and universities around the country. Um, it's really led to everything that I've done in education, because it showed me how uh, the music that I do and the knowledge that I have as a result of the research that I do to do these small little programs can benefit. You know, we talk about the multiplier effect. You talk to a class of you know 40 kids. And, or you actually, even more important, you talk to uh, a teacher or five teachers, and those five teachers are going to reach that many kids, and they're going to also reach other teachers who are going to reach that many kids, the multiplier effect, they call it. Um, and over the course of time, as a result of doing teacher workshops around the nation, I have no idea how many communities we've connected with. Well, you have done a lot of wonderful things, helping a lot of people, and you finally got your own solo CD which is called Ready to Go. And I must say the graphics were done by a woman who lives in the same neighborhood that we live. So yeah. we are a self-sufficient community. So I'm, we'll ask you some more stuff later, but right now I'm going to ask you to sing a song. Happy to. So let's get you up here. Well, I chose this song uh, because it's the title cut to my CD, <laughs> but also because, the, you know, songs you write are often at change points. Um, do what I want, okay? 
So uh, in uh, 2015, uh, Kim and I decided that uh, our personal relationship was um, not resolving a number of things that both of us needed resolving, and uh, we decided to move in different directions while still, you know, staying on mission. And I had I'm faced with this this new opportunity to be a solo artist. It's like, oh joy, after 40 years of branding. <laughs> uh, but the fr freedom that came with that, in amongst the terror of, I'll never work again. Greg Greenway and several others said, don't worry. <laughs> uh, but I was worried. Uh, but then in 2016, I mean, I continued doing some of the things I was doing, and in 2016, um, this thing happened. Donald Trump got elected. And, uh, and I was looking at that, and in the parlance of the African-American community, as some of the folks that I often run into in Mississippi and Alabama, when we take our pilgrims, mostly white, into those communities, and they say, oh my God, we're so devastated about Trump, and we're so devastated about this Republican you know, hate campaign, and, and our, our pilgrims in those neighborhoods look at our pilgrims and they go, y'all think this is new? Hmm. Well, I was sitting on a beach in Florida on my birthday, and I was saying to myself, how can I represent the fact that this is not new? I began to think of this little song, and it became a bigger song for me. I realized that as my mother said, I was singing at three, and I used to stand around the piano in our living room and sing, and I would sing in church. Those, those songs still mean something to me. Those voices in that community that I heard punctuated by the rhythm on the floor as people were tapping those feet. They've been doing that for hundreds of years. So, the <laughs> message came to me, you ain't doing this by yourself. I have lots of allies in this journey. So the song is, I'm ready to go. Well, I'm sitting here, think about the word of day. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Got a lot on my mind, but I'm blessed to say. Glory, hallelujah, I'm ready to go. We're all living in a world turned upside down. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Gonna take some time to turn it around. Glory, hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Oh, mama, it's a long, long road. We got a world of trouble and a world of pain. Oh, glory, hallelujah. They keep spinning the truth in freedom's name. Glory, hallelujah, I'm ready to go. When the haters pull up, I just sing my song. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Keep my mind on track, keeps my spirit strong. Glory, hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Oh, mama, it's a long, long road. You got me singing with the seeds you sow. It's up for me, so come with me. Glory, hallelujah, it's a righteous day. Glory, hallelujah, I'm on my way. Well, I know I can't do this all by myself. Oh, glory, hallelujah. It's a long, hard journey, gonna need some help. Glory, hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Well, I'm sitting here thinking about the world of day. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Got friends by my side and I'm blessed to say, glory, hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Oh, mama, it's a long, long road. You got me singing with the seeds you sow. It's up for me, so come with me. Glory, hallelujah, it's a righteous day. Glory, hallelujah, I'm on my way. Oh, oh, oh mama, it's a long, long road. You got me singing with the seeds Right. 
our third panelist here, Doug Yeager, and for those uh, that don't know about him, I'm going to give you the cliff notes here. <laughs> okay, so in his 52-year career, Doug has been an entertainment producer, an artist manager, a record producer, a music <coughs> publisher, and a producer of theater, film, and television. And as a member of the American folk community, he's managed artists that include Tom Paxton, Richie Havens, Ramblin' Jack Elliott, Odetta, David Amram, who he still manages, who's here at NERFA and who is a lovely human being. He gave me some dirt on you, so we'll get there. From 1976 to 1984, Doug produced and coordinated talent for events at the White House, United Nations, and the Kremlin. And uh, Doug was friend and collaborator with many of the key figures in Greenwich Village who promoted the folk revival. Uh, that is just cliff notes. Um, I, I joked with Doug, I reached out to him a couple days ago to see if we could get together before this panel and talk, and he was like, absolutely, here's my number, and then he said, and here's my bio. And when I met him today, I joked with him that I hadn't called him because I was too busy reading his bio. Yeah. Since then, I've been reading it. <laughs> Because there's just so many great things, uh, it's an honor to be able to interview you. I think I want to start recently with an idea that I had, you know, being here at NERFA, what we just did, singing along together, music, right? It's so powerful, it's so connective, it's so important, it saves lives, you know, it's something we talk about, the power of music, right? Um, and you worked on a project, project recently, co-wrote and co-produced a documentary film called Free to Rock, how rock and roll helped end the Cold War. So that's a very like tangible documentary put together to talk about that that idea, right? I wanted you to maybe tell us a little bit about this documentary, and you're writing a book now to go along with it, right? Thank you, and, and thank you, Trett and Reggie. Those beautiful songs. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, a friend I had gone to college in France with years ago. Um, he lived in San Diego and he was in New York and we had dinner and he started telling me the story of all of his Soviet ex-rocker, no, ex-Soviet rocker friends who lived in America and he said, you know, they all truly believed that rock and roll was the main reason for the collapse of the totalitarian communist system and the collapse of the Soviet Empire. And I sat there thinking, and I had worked in the Soviet Union as a consultant to the State Department and to the Soviet Ministry of Culture, bringing American acts to the Soviet Union and Soviet acts to America. And I had also been working with um, all these artists through the years, like Odetta and Josh White Jr. and his father and, and all the other artists you mentioned who were involved in social movements the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement. And so I knew the power of music. And so I was intrigued and he said, well, let's make a, a documentary. And, and I said, well, I, I think it's a great idea, but I'm not sure if I'm, I said, I'm almost 60 and, and uh, I, I've been involved with all these great projects and they took so long cost so much money and the great artistic successes and I lose money each time. And he said, oh, we can do this in two years. And I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I'll do it. And, and I, I went on the computer when I got home and there were more than 200 articles on the subject. They were teaching it at universities in Kiev and St. Petersburg. And yet 
everyone I spoke to on the street, I would just ask people, what do you think of this? And everybody thought I was nuts. They couldn't connect. <coughs> they couldn't connect the music and the collapse of the Soviet Empire. However, people who studied Cold War history, who studied international relations, people who understood the power of music and what it could do to affect changes in societies, they understood it. And so we found out that uh, in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, rock music began in Riga, Latvia. Why Riga, Latvia? because they had erected 2,500 radio jamming stations around the Iron Curtain to prevent radio from coming in, from propaganda coming in from music. They considered rock and roll a creation of the CIA, the Kremlin and KGB. They, they believed it seriously, and it was a danger to them. It was forbidden. Electric guitars were forbidden. Singing in English was forbidden. They, dancing, having, you know, concerts, everything was forbidden. And so uh, Riga, which is on the Baltic Sea, right across from Scandinavia, they couldn't block the radio waves. <laughs> and young kids there, 13, 14 years old, would Jerry rig their radios and at the middle of the night, it would be scratchy, but they would hear these sounds coming through. Everyone we interviewed, and in one of the questions we would ask everybody, do you remember the first time you heard rock music? And they, they became very nervous, and, and they said, yes. And, and so, what was it? What is it that you heard? And said, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know what they were saying but we knew it was the sound of freedom. Oh. <laughs> it ch chokes me up just to think of that. Because all they were allowed to hear were Russian folk songs, Russian classical music, and the songs of the Red Army Chorus. That's it. And they didn't know what this was. But they knew it was liberating. Yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> we got on a plane and we flew to Latvia two weeks <clears throat> after that dinner. And I said, Nick, if we can't prove the thesis to our satisfaction while we're there, we'll do this for two weeks. We'll hire a film crew. And if we can't prove it, then we had a nice little vacation. <laughs> Unfortunately, or fortunately as it may be, the very first person we interviewed had been uh, arrested a dozen times by the KGB, had been beaten and tortured, and they threatened to kill his family if he continued singing rock and roll. And the songs he was singing were Ricky Nelson and Fats Domino oh, yeah. songs. Not protest music, just innocent. And we realize right away <clears throat> they considered him such a threat that they were willing to kill his family that they were serious about it and of course before sadly he became one of my closest friends and he died two years ago but prior to that he was on a <clears throat> he was on a Latvian postage stamp he received their highest civilian honors in the country and till the day died he only sang 50s rock and roll and, and he was the king of rockabilly music in all of Europe by the time he died anyway so then we so now we <clears throat> we knew we had to continue and so after two weeks we had the Latvian story and then we realized by talking to friends we both had in Russia that the story in Russia was very different. One, because of the radio blockages, they didn't, they didn't really hear rock much until the Beatles came. So it was almost a decade later. Also, the African-American rock and roll of, of Little Richard and these artists was just too foreign for their understanding. People lived in the Baltics, all felt they were part of Europe. 
Russia Slavic people and the music they grew up with, with the classical orientation and harmonies, the Beatles fit that perfectly. And so Little Richard was just too outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we had a whole nother story. Plus we found out that the kids in the Baltics had started listening to rock. These were kids rebelling against society. Not unlike the kids in America who first started performing rock music. The kids in Moscow were the children of the communist leaders. <laughs> they were the children of the nomenclature. And so this music gave them personal liberation and freedom of expression, but they didn't want to get rid of the system. And they didn't want to overthrow the government. So we realized, oh my, this is a whole other story. <laughs> Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, they were distant from Moscow, so you had more underground happening there. And then we realized, well, <coughs> the story in Eastern Europe is very different. So now we're interviewing diplomats from Czechoslovakia and Hungary and East Germany, and uh, each story was different. And so all of a sudden this became very complicated, and then we came to the other realization that uh, unless we get, let's say, the voice of the East and the voice of the West, the academics would not accept it, since no one could believe what we were doing anyway in America. And so it wasn't until we got Jimmy Carter and Mikhail Gorbachev to sit down with us, and they supported our thesis, and a KGB general who supported the thesis and near the end of the movie, he says, when you're dealing with an opposing force, you can fight them militarily, or you can fight them with music and culture. And he said, that is always more successful, and that's precisely what happened to the Soviet Union and its collapse. He says that wow. near the end of the film. Wow. What's the name of this movie? Free to Rock. <laughs> <laughs> and, how, and how long did it take you to make it all? 12 years, <laughs> so that two-year project that we thought would cost $250,000 was 12 years, cost 1.2 million, and uh, so another had another artistic success. <laughs> Where I'll never, never see a dime. <laughs> and it, it uh, so it was on PBS last year, and this year it's released all through Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, and in Europe it, um, it has gained a lot more mileage because they understand the story better, their kids are much better educated, mm -hmm. they know the Cold War, um, it was all close to them. Uh, if you really think about it here and there, the center of the Cold War for us was Berlin. Right which is a thousand miles west of Moscow. And so that was very close to everybody in, in Western Europe. And um, so we, it, it, it's fascinating, the State Department, we had done shows in Washington for the Congress at the US Capitol and at the State Department for the Foreign Service Officers and uh, the Diplomatic Corps. And uh, the State Department, then sent me on seven tours of Europe and North Africa where we would screen the film, have uh, discussions and Q&As with the audience. About half of the time we'd have panel discussions with diplomats and historians, journalists. And so it's a, a subject of, of great interest over there and it's still, and, and we're starting to get some leverage or, or mileage here with uh, universities Great. and uh, Again, so it's called Free to Rock, uh, How Rock and Roll Helped End the Cold War came out last year, and so very fascinating. It's on Amazon. Yeah. You can get the DVD on Amazon.com. Yeah. So switching gears, uh, something David Amram told me to ask you, which I would regret not, is can you tell us about how you met Chuck Berry? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I the first... Uh, five years 
in, in Europe and in America, in Cincinnati, where I had been living before I went to Europe, I, I was a concert promoter. And so, uh, um, two friends of mine, and we built, uh, I don't know, we had this idea, we built the largest rock club in the United States. And uh, so it was perfect to do concerts too. And so we, we did the James Gang, Almon Brothers, uh, Genesis, yes, uh, Leonard Skinner, Aerosmith, uh, three shows with Little Feet. <laughs> and they were just starting out, and, and Warner Brothers was supporting them, something we don't have today, a record right. company do that. Right. You know, I, could, I, I said I don't know what they're going to draw, I could pay you $250, and the record company paid the rest. Wow. <clears throat> Did Fanny, yeah. had Fanny yeah. there too, yeah. Jim Millington. Yeah. And so, um, uh, we did a lot of concerts, and one of them was Chuck Berry. and. Uh, it was interesting because he had a set fee and you didn't know how he would come, you didn't know where he was going. Most artists want you to help them with their transportation or arrange housing or... Yeah, anything you can do. Yeah. yeah. He, the only thing with him was you send 50% of the money up front, do you have a band that will play for him? He will show up at the time of the show, and you didn't know when he was arriving. Like, and so, it, it was no problem getting a band, because every, at, in, this was 1970, and in 1970, every rock musician in the world knew every Chuck Berry song, every lick. So, you know, you, you didn't need to rehearse. And, and so, the concert was at 8 o'clock, and, uh, Still no word from Chuck. I had, well, they didn't have cell phones in, so it wasn't like I could call him. And so uh, the, we even had the band go on stage just to play some warm up music because we have a room full of people. And uh, so it's about seven after eight, and a guy from the front door knocks on my office. He said, Doug, uh, Mr. Barry's here. And he comes in and he has a <clears throat> guitar case in one hand and his briefcase in the other. I say, hi Chuck, he doesn't say hello. <laughs> he puts his guitar case down, puts his briefcase down and he's standing there and he opens a briefcase and he pulled out a 45 revolver with uh, a what do you call it? The, uh, like a butt line special with a oh, long barrel. Long barrel. The longest barrel you ever saw. He puts it in my face what? and said, so I've come for the rest of my money. For some reason, I wasn't afraid. I, I, I wasn't mad. I understood this guy's gone through hell in his life and been in prison twice and probably didn't get paid half of his gigs in the 1940s, right? And so I said, well, gee, Chuck, you didn't have to do what I was planning to pay you. And so I go and I open the safe and I take out the money, give it to him. He puts the gun back in his case. He said, okay, show me to the stage. <laughs> So I, I walk him down to the dressing room, he opens the guitar case, takes the guitar out, and the band sees him, because the dressing room was right off the stage, and he walks out on stage, and as he's walking on, he said, Johnny, be good. He plugs in, they go into Johnny, be good, and his contract was for 60 minutes. Most acts, it be, will be longer than but usually if it's 60, you, you figure you'll get three, four encores from it. Mm -hmm. I swear, it, we didn't get to 60 minutes in one second. He finished the last song on 60 minutes, <laughs> walked right off the stage, put his guitar in his case, and his briefcase walked out the door, didn't say goodbye, got in his limousine and drove away. <laughs> and so then, so that was 1970. In 1974, I, I was man managing uh, France's first famous rock band, Les Variations, and, 
and we were on the charts here in American touring, and we're out in Los Angeles doing the Midnight Special, the TV show. And our publicist out there was dating Chuck. <laughs> and she's, and of course, the guys in my band, they all grew up listening, Armed Forces Radio said they, and she said, would, would you all like to have lunch at Chuck's house? <laughs> and so, we, we go over to his house, and I mean, he's, Chuck, uh, of, of all the ro early rock and rollers, Chuck wrote all of his own music. He published all his own music. So he made a lot more money than all the other early rockers. He owned everything. And, and he had a huge Beverly Hills mansion, tennis courts, outback, swing pool, everything. And you go inside, and all the walls had black drapes. I mean, it's like a mausoleum inside. Uh, wow. So you couldn't see out, and nobody could see in. And uh, it was it was a very strange lunch. You, you, <laughs> it wasn't very com conversational. And after about an hour, sixty minutes. <laughs> not one second more. He, he said, uh, "Would you like to see a movie?" And the, you know, our French guys, yeah, yeah. And so. This is back then where you, you, you didn't have big screen. You, you had big screens with like a rear projector. Yeah, it was yeah. and you couldn't see it well. And, and he sits down in front of it, and, 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 and guys pull chairs. And it was the concert footage of Chuck Berry. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the, uh, the moment he was over, he got up and he said, Okay, guys, he said, uh, thanks for coming. And, and that was it, but it was just I interesting. I mean, he was a fascinating character. Oh, boy. And uh, anyway, so. I want to say thank you, David, for telling her to ask that. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and so he didn't hint at all as to what the story was. So. Ah, okay. And I just love that one of the questions I wanted to ask you since you've worked with so many artists, is can it be difficult to work with musicians sometimes? <laughs> I, I remember when, <clears throat> when Lay Variations broke up. I mean, it's fascinating that half the year they would be touring America, and so it's too expensive to live in New York or LA, so I, I got a band house in Cincinnati where I had been a promoter, and I. And they lived right there, a block from the UC, and terrorized all the women for at the school for like four years. But here you have these French rockers with platform boots oh, as high in sequence, walking around, in, you know, a college town, and it was pretty bizarre. And but after that experience, and and they were wild, crazy guys, and. Uh, uh, burned me out, and I had told my partners in New York, I said, I'm, I'm, I've decided I'm going to become a poetry professor. <laughs> I thought, I, I was thinking back to a poetry class I took in college, and we would go outside and sit under a tree and read poetry. And I said, wow, that's what I need. And, and, but I, I've got I've got all this equipment, the truck and everything, and and, and all their equipment, and, and I call my partners and I said, look, I'm gonna bring the equipment back. I'll, I'll stay for a week, and I still had the house with the band lived in, and I said I'm gonna come back here and and teach poetry under a tree, and and uh, I was there one week and and. Uh, we brought in a new partner who had just uh, left as the vice president of A&R at, at uh, Vanguard Records, David Wilkes. And, and of course they had a lot of major folk artists. And I had been to Peter, Paul and Mary concerts and I knew who Dylan and Joan Baez and I had a Judy Collins right there. But I didn't, and there, were, there was a great folk singer from Cincinnati named Danny Cox, who mm -hmm. you may have he now lives in Kansas City, and uh, and I knew Danny, and but that was my 
exposure to folk music. And a week later, uh, David walks in the office with Josh White Jr. And Josh hadn't worked for five years. One year after his father died, his wife was murdered. <clears throat> and he took his two kids and went upstate New York. And uh, he just had to get away from it and had to raise his kids. And um, and he only his only gig, there was a, you still were at the tail end of listening room coffee houses around the country. And so the equivalent of the bitter end in New York, it, it was called the Raven Gallery in Detroit. And he was their biggest star. So he could, and you would still go in three, four weeks at a time. That's the way it used to be years ago. And so 20 weeks a year, he could work at the Raven Gallery and try to do it in summers most, you know, and he'd take his kids with him. And so that was the only gig he did for five years. And so, uh, and, and he hadn't recorded. In those days in the record business, if you didn't have an album out every two years, you would be forgotten. Four years, you're forgotten. So we signed him to Vanguard, we did an album, and then uh, we said, well, we gotta get you on the road, and so uh, he said, so uh, of your peers, you know, that you started out with, that who is still working, and maybe we'll have you tour with. And so immediately we had him on tour with Richie Havens and with Tom Paxton, and with Odetta, and in each case, none of them had a manager at the time. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, within a couple of months, managing all these people <laughs> and, and a whole other, you know, yeah. so much for poetry, but so much for how to rock and roll, too. And, uh, yeah, that's right. But, but I had been involved prior to that since the mid 60s with the civil rights movement, with the anti war movement. So, the music these people, the songs they were singing, the lyrics, they, they were important to my social soul. Mm -hmm. And I <clears throat> and I said, uh, you know, this is, uh, I can be proud to do this. I'm not going to have a nervous breakdown <laughs> at every concert. And, uh, uh, and, and I feel proud representing these people. And so that was 1976. And so I, though I worked with jazz music and different produced film and TV and whatever, but uh, I've stayed with the folk artists since then. Great. Uh, Thank you. Sonny, how do you feel? It's 420. Do you want to open it up? or? Well, have you another question for Doug? Uh, well, we, we did definitely 15 minutes, so I don't want to go too long. We can get, we can get More from Doug. He's no man. You know? <laughs> I guess I can't I mean, tell you how embarrassed I was when she called me, <laughs> and, and, and she said, you, "You're over seventy, aren't you?" And I said, "Yes." And she said, "Would you be an elder to with them?" And I go, "Oh my God!" That that legitimized my age. You know? I guess this could be a question for everyone, if you don't mind. Um, I was sort of thinking that you know. Getting, trying to get wisdom from you guys. Uh, how much? I know, right? How much? I mean, all three of you are so successful in what you've done. You know, we've talked about your careers. You know, we could talk for hours more. Giving advice to people of a younger generation who want to do music or do some of the things that you've done. Uh, is it right place, right time? Is it connections? Is it networking? Is it persistence and determination alone? Or what is it, and I know it's a tough, broad question, but is there any like little wisdom you would impart? If, I, if I'll just start and continue yeah. what you had said earlier. Good, that takes me off the <laughs> I, I would always tell young artists that would come to us. I, I actually had all of these elder statesmen of the folk community at that time working with, so didn't have time for working with young artists, but they would always come to us. And then we started uh, the National Coffee House Circuit. Mm -hmm. And so there we had a lot of young artists who would do it, and, and, and comedians like Billy Crystal, et cetera, you know, they started off in the Coffee House Circuit. But I, I would always tell them, and at that time, the even back then, the, the record business was not as easy as it was, and 
It changed dramatically once disco music came in. Why? Because disco music always had a, it was producer driven, and the songs were actually not even written until they were in the studio because they had a formula of rhythm. And then maybe the lyrics would be written and they'd just get a session vocalist to come in and sing them. So all of a sudden, within six months, every record company in New York got rid of their producers. So whereas prior to that, I could call up any record company in New York and say, I've got a great singer songwriter, can we come in? And we go with the producer, we'd go in a studio, and if he likes a few songs, he would record us, and the deal would be we have eight weeks to sign a deal with our label, using, and this is the demo, mm -hmm. and uh, if not, you can take the demo and go to another co company. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was a pretty good deal. But after disco, you know, which was 78, 79, it started, it become, because all of a sudden accountants started running the record companies. Mm -hmm. So I would tell young artists, I, I'd say, you have to know what each professional in this business does. You have to know what a manager does. You have to know what a booking agent does, what a publicist does, what a record producer does. And you have to learn all those jobs. And, and then I, I would tell them of certain artists I knew that maybe weren't the greatest talents, but they were great business minds and they became successful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and ones who were great talents, you know, fell along the, the wayside because they, they still didn't know how to scramble an egg or, or use the laundromat. And so I, I think that still applies today, mm -hmm. especially the young artists come here. You have to know every aspect of the business and you have to learn how to do it yourself. If you can get a booking agent to help you, great, or if you can get a manager, if you can have the money to hire a publicist, but if not, you've got to do it yourself. I would, I would say, I would tag on to that, that um, young artists today have resources <coughs> that we didn't have. Uh, there are college uh, courses, programs, um, there are industry, uh, well there's Google. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of things um, to give you information about what you don't know. But at the same time, there are less places to apply it. Um, so it's a, a, a very classic dilemma in a lot of ways and certainly you know people were looking at well you you can get your music out there um, you don't have to have a record company decide to promote you um, to get you to the public the problem with that is um, there are, everybody has that same advantage <laughs> there's also no vetting um, I think one of the things about the process as it was that you didn't get to perform in those vaunted places until you had done some real work to improve yourself, your skill, your talent, your, you had to know something about yourself and you also were in, um, we came up looking at those artists who were in front of us, who were the big stars. It wasn't that so much that they were the big stars, but when I recognized the fact that I wanted to be one of those artists and I did want to become a big star, I really worked to notice what those people were doing. I wanted to be at their feet. I wanted to open for those people and watch their show. I wanted to see how they delivered a performance. And I worked in a comedy club for two and a half years, Kim and I did, in Philadelphia. And people say, you worked in a comedy club? Yeah, we were the musical relief. For people like Jay Leno and Michael Keaton and you know all the co rising comics. I got to sit through five hours a night of watching comedians Work an audience. The, that's the hardest. It is the hardest. You don't have an instrument. I mean, it's just you are naked, and it's hard to make people laugh. And it wasn't so much about making them laugh. It's pacing. It's language. It's understanding that audience to how to take them from wherever they come in and guide them through what it is your expertise is and get to an end result. It's drama. You know. It's you know em empathy. It's pain. Um, but the other thing I got from all of those years is, because we chased it, we got, we got an a offer in Philadelphia uh, from guys who used to come to our shows all the time, our four set nights, <laughs> and um, 
And the guy said, I'm a record producer. And uh, he told us who he was with, and uh, he lived in Society Hills Towers in Philly. <laughs> and uh, he invited us up. He played like 20 songs of artists that he was representing, both here and, and internationally. And he said, those songs that you're doing, I can take those and make them disco hits. Yeah. He said, I, I like... What year are we talking? We're talking 1981, 82. Okay. Yeah. And he said, I can make your songs disco hits, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I can guarantee you you're going to be successful. You'll, you'll sell records. And, and we said, yeah, but our songs are kind of about things. <laughs> and he basically said, yeah, you know, whatever. You know. <laughs> He said, yeah, and then he said, when we were kind of looking like, eh, we're not a good sell, he said, you know, once you're a big star, you can do anything you want. And we looked at each other and we said, that might be true, but can we really do something that is so foreign to our hearts and souls? And we decided that we could. And so, you know, I remember the day we called him and we said, uh, Thank you, it's a, it's a wonderful offer, but um, no, we really can't do that. And he said, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> and we said, no, we're really not. And, uh, and I realized in that year and the coming years that what, what's important for doing this long term is that your heart's in it. Even when it's not popular, that you respect what it is you do and that you do something that is generated by a passion so strong that when you hit the hard times, and they will come, when you don't have food on the table and you have to go out and street perform, or you have to take another job, or what, when you hit the hard times, the, the only thing that drove me every day to the music was my passion for doing it. And my passion for doing it in a way that informed me and, and in, you know, in such a way that when the, create, when the creativity came, I recognized it. And because the things that I'm doing today all come from things that Kim and I were doing years ago when mostly nobody wanted to hear it. But we just kept getting better at doing what we were doing. And eventually, it took us somewhere. And then, you know, and now, you know, it's a, it's a whole different thing. And I'm still not the most popular person on the block. I'm still not the most, you know, visible artist. Still not the most. No but disco hits. No. <laughs> <laughs> not even one. <laughs> but I know that, just a closing, I know that um, every time I go out, and I said this a few years ago, every time I enter a building and do music, I know why I'm there. I know what my skills are. I know how to reach people with that. It doesn't mean they're all going to like it. But I also know that on a very deep level, I respect myself in such a way that if they don't like it, I'm not challenged by it. I know my, my songs, my music finds a message. Well, just in terms of, of how you grow uh, as an artist, um, similarly, when I, was, uh, when I had my first record deal in, on MCA Records, um, I was the opening act for, I was the walk-in act in 20,000 seat arenas for groups like Yes and Poco and the Jay Giles Band, Black Oak, Arkansas, me and my little guitar. Yeah. I was the walk-in act and it was frightening. And it was, I thought, why am I doing this? Because these kids would all come in, this was like 1973, and they would be stoned on quaaludes, and they'd come up to the stage and say, Laura a quaalude! You know, it's like, no, I'm trying to do my work here. <laughs> and, but there was one, I mean, I knew I was cutting my teeth, and I was paying my dues. And it all came to a beautiful end. This last show I did for, in this tour, this whole thing, was at the Armadillo headquarters in Austin, Texas, which was a great venue in those days. And I started doing my set, and the front section, which is about half, to the, of this room, started singing along on my song, Catalina. They knew my song, because I had gotten enough airplay in Texas. And it was like, I just did something to my heart, because I was about to, like, this is not working for me. And when, I, when that night happened, it really changed my life. And I knew I had to continue, but on my own terms. I wasn't going to do, I wasn't going to do that anymore. <laughs> just, yeah. I, I, if I, I could just uh, relate to that in 19, 70, 70, 
I was touring with The Who. Well, I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was touring with The Who in the Midwest, and the James Gang was their opening act, but at the Cleveland Auditorium, which was a 10,000 seat hall, with no seats, you would just stand there, walk right. there. And that one act, they had a third, that show, they had a third act. And it was a young man with his acoustic guitar sitting on a chair. He wasn't even standing or on his feet, just sitting on a chair, looking down. And he sang these songs, and I, I was trying to listen, but no one in the hall paid any attention. They're all walking around talking, drinking, eating. And two months later, all those songs were heard on the radio. That was James Taylor. And nobody paid any attention to him. And none of those songs meant anything to them. Until like Catalina, all of a sudden they heard it on the radio. And then they would sit and listen. And it may not have been the Who's audience that would sit and listen, but there was a big audience out there. <coughs> My next question, I, I love humor, I love to laugh. I think we all need that. I was wondering if you could think of any humorous events that you had along the way. <laughs> that do or do not include a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. An experience that was funny. Um, gosh, dead silence. <laughs> well, I mean, there's um, one, one moment that sticks in my mind, it was, wasn't funny at the time, but it is in hindsight. Um, in, in 83, in hindsight, that's, you'll see why I think that's funny now. Um, in 1983, uh, uh, Olivia Records had produced a show, it was called uh, Meg and Chris at Carnegie Hall. And we had two sold out back to back shows at Carnegie Hall, all, all women in the audience. And I was the producer of the show and I was also the, the mixing engineer, so I was the one who dealt with the truck because it was a union hall. And I would have to run back and forth between the truck and the stage to make sure the sounds were right and I was also producing the band. And um, we had two chances to get a take. And, and in one of the first shows, and this is, you're, you're talking about 2,800 women dressed in gowns and tails and whatever. <laughs> And the sound guy, the, the, the monitor guy, comes out on stage to move a monitor and moons, a big guy, moons 2,800 women. And also ruined the take because he moved the monitor and caused feedback. And then I had one take to work with. That was just. No pictures? <laughs> I'm trying to think of it, you know, I mean, there have been a million of them, you know. Um, well, then let me rephrase this. Let's say, how about memorable moments that aren't to be funny, just some moment that you'll never there. forget. <laughs> okay. Can you think Okay. <clears throat> uh, one that just pops in my head right now was um, the, the Oscar-winning filmmaker Jonathan Demme had made a... Uh, concert film with Neil Young called Hearts of Gold. Mm. So this was probably around 2006 and um, and Meryl Streep was going to throw a, uh, a part, she did throw a, a reception, this was at Lincoln Center, so one room reception where everybody was eating, drinking, socializing, and then we went to the theater sitting there and it was at Alice Tully Hall which is constructed, uh, the first 500 seats are like orchestra. Mm -hmm. Then there was a, a level right, like the ground level at the, the same level as the top of the seats in front. And there, that's where you'd walk in. So then there's like 600 seats up here. And so in the uh, front row, um, I was sitting with Odetta, and uh, Sidney Lumet and Arthur Penn, who were Jonathan Demme's two mentors and idols. And the room was full of movie stars, because Meryl Streep was doing this, full of movie stars, rock stars, friends of Neil Young's, etc. And so before the film begins, um, Jonathan Demme's telling about the making of the 
film, how he and Neil had been friends for years. And then he wanted to thank, you know, and he was naming like 13 people in the audience. Then he gets down to, and my two mentors, Arthur Penn, Sidney Lumet, and everybody's fine. And, and then he said, and Neil and I want to thank the great, great Odette. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah. And the whole room stood up and cheered. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's fabulous. And then after the film, <coughs> Jonathan brought Neil over. And Odette and I are standing there. And Neil comes over and he gets <laughs> he gets down on his knees. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. Well, that is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And she was dead two years later. Uh, we were in the middle of recording a uh, uh, Guide My Feet CD with Magpie, and um, in the middle of the recording, we got a phone call from her agent, and um, she said, I got a really great gig for you. And we said, what's that? And she said, uh, and a, a group in Houston uh, wants you to come in and do a concert. Well, it's not exactly a concert. So, okay, what is it? Well, they're doing a big production. There's a play, the Underground Railroad, and um, they want you to come in and do some music for it. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, play, you know. And, and she said, well, it's not quite for the play. But she said, the money's really good. <laughs> so we suspended, you know, we took two days out of recording sessions, and uh, we flew to Houston, first class. And uh, we got to Houston, and we get to the hotel, and we check in, and they flew us in that day. The event's going to be about three hours later. And so we get to our hotel room, we get upstairs, and phone rings, and it's this... Uh, young woman who's the uh, uh, stage monitor for this whole thing. And she says, I'm, I'm here. I'm really happy you're here. And I want to come up and talk to you. And we said, great. And so she came up and she said, I'm really happy to have you here. And uh, what it was was the, uh, the play The Underground Railroad, which is a wonderful play, was being put on by the Houston Opera, uh, Houston, uh, a theater in Houston. I forget the name of the theater, but it's a really great theater. And, uh, but we were not going to get to go to the theater. Um, but what they wanted us to do is, before the uh, event, before the theater presentation, they were having a big dinner. And everybody who was anybody in Houston was coming to that dinner. And they wanted us to stand by the escalator at the bottom of the ramp, uh, the escalator that went up to the ballroom, to sing for people as they went on their way oh. up to dinner. And, uh, and she says, so I, uh, I, I saw your, uh, your listed with the National Historic Trust, and I, I see that you're, uh, you do this whole thing on the underground railroad. I, and I see, I, would, I, I, look, I list, listened to some of your CD, and um, I, I see that some of the songs about the underground railroad are, are really upbeat, and others are not so upbeat. Uh, so I was wondering if you could basically just do the upbeat ones. And I looked at her, and you know, I said, uh, so you, you you kind of you know about the underground railroad, <laughs> and she said, "Oh yes, yes, I do." That. And I said, "And you, you, you know about slavery?" And she said, "Oh yeah." And I said, "So you know that the songs we're singing came out of that experience of slavery?" And she said, "Yes." And I said, "The answer to your question is, no, no. We'll we'll do all the songs." And she said, "That's great. That's great." <laughs> so what I want you to do is we'll, we'll sing there, and that'll be about a half an hour. And literally, as we sang, people went by us. That feels good. They they heard us collectively for about forty five seconds, and they went to dinner. And then she said, "Now we need you to go down the street, and we have reenactors in the street, and uh, and you're going to stand on a hay bale oh. <laughs> and sing." And I said, "No, no hay bale. <laughs> no, no." So we, they positioned us in front of a hay wagon. And we sang as people went to the theater. Another collective 45 seconds. Yeah. As reenactors ran around and shot their guns off. And, uh, yeah. and they paid us a lot of money for that. For something that largely any black person who sings in Houston could have done. <laughs> so it's a great benefit to us because we really needed the money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, they kept us up, flew us back, and, and that was that, you know. And, and those kinds of things have often come up. Um, now, in the same way, I, I was hired to come in for a conference that the Omega Institute was doing called In the Shelter of Each Other. 
And I wrote a song for the conference that they were doing, and that morning, in, uh, I would sing the song, and then the keynote speaker was Maya Angelou. Mm. And so I got to perform my song and see Maya Angelou stand on the side of the stage singing my song. Mm. For more than 45 seconds. For more than 45 seconds. <laughs> but the, the amazing thing was uh, the humanity of it all. Uh, as I was standing backstage, I had just finished the song at 3 that morning. Because I, you know, I had to write two verses in there, and so I didn't have the song in my head, but I was close to memorizing it. And as I stood backstage, and I'm going through the song, a door opened, and in came Elizabeth Lesser, who's one of the founders of Omega, and uh, stage manager, and a couple people, and behind them was Maya Angelou. Mm. And as she came down the, the hallway, they were going to pass right by me, and I just said to myself, "Be cool. <laughs> She's not here for you." So I said good morning to Elizabeth as she passed me, and the stage manager said hi, and other people passed, and then I thought, I'm going to be respectful, allow her her space, and move by. And as she passed me, she stopped, she turned, took one step toward me, and she said, good morning, darling. <laughs> How are you today? And the entire song went right out of my head. <laughs> So I had enough time to write the song out and stick it to my guitar. Uh, Doug, you, you mentioned how you got involved with Odetta and Tom Paxton uh, and Josh, but you didn't mention David Amram. How did you start with him? Ah. I think we only have about a minute here, a minute or two. <laughs> so keep oh it God. Cliff Notes version. Give us the short version. The short version. Uh, I, I've known David for years, because he would show up at all these folk festivals and and uh, at concerts, and uh, I didn't know him well, and people would say, oh yeah, he's a famous classical composer and conductor, and I thought this was surprising that he would show up at these folk events <laughs> with his 35 instruments, you know, and, yeah. and play with you. And then I got to know him better because he and Odetta were very close friends. They were the same age, uh, and they would share their birthdays together. Um, uh, David was six weeks older than Odetta. They would, and often, I think, 70th birthday, 75th birthday, you would share them. And so got to know him better then at, at those times. And then, um, we had the memorial for Odetta at Riverside Church with 2,500 people and 80, more than 80 people on stage, speakers, musicians, and celebrities, and video. And David opened it, um, uh, doing Amazing Grace. And uh, a week later, a friend of mine called me, and he was making a documentary that was to take place in uh, Ma Mali. And uh, he said, uh, Doug, do, do you know any film composers who know <laughs> Middle Eastern mu Arabic music, or African music, et cetera, et cetera? And by this time, I knew David's background as a composer of 20 different genres of music and, and film composer. And I suggested Dave, and uh, and I so I called Dave, and and he said, "Well, I, I'd be interested." And I said, "Would you like me to negotiate the deal for you?" And and uh, and I said, oh. "He said yes," and so I did, and he was happy with that. And <laughs> then uh, I forget whether I said. To you, would, would would you want me to be your manager, or, or you said to me, would, anyway? And so we just started working right from that first film composer That's gig, great. and I had no idea what a adventure it would be, because <laughs> <laughs> well, David is unlike any musical artist. No, ever I, I can vouch for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here. You know that these uh, events are recorded and then they're put up on YouTube, so if you want to see it again or have friends that you think would enjoy that they did, that weren't here, we're, we're creating an archive. All of the wisdom events have been are up on YouTube so you can really get a, a great
sense of, of our community. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Reggie Harris. Thank you, Doug Yeager. Thank you, Jeff Hewitt. And thank you, Jeff Hanna, for being a co-host. See you around.